Good morning. Name is Brandon Ziske, lead pastor here at Austin Oaks Church. Um, glad to be with you. If you're a guest or visiting with us, I um, want to let you know that we're a church that strives to be simply about Jesus. We want to help people meet, know, and follow him because we believe that when you encounter him, it changes everything. And I um, also want to quickly thank you for praying for me while I was up north um, speaking at my former church's college winter conference. Um, it was a great time. Um, it's all God do some amazing things, but it was also hard because it was cold and snowy and, and sorry that I brought it back with me, right? So it's just always funny because when I bring up snow here, like Austinites are like really excited. It's kind of like, it snowed! You're like, no, it didn't snow, it dusted. It's like, let's just, let's just get this right, okay? Um, so, hey, just real quick, um, starting next week, if for five weeks after that, we're going to be in a very um, powerful sermon series I want to encourage you to be part of, okay? And I want to like, challenge you to make sure that you're, you're here as best as you can for those five weeks. And if you're not, I, I want to encourage you to watch those online. They're going to be a very foundational series for us in our church in the next chapter where we sense the Lord taking us. So we're going to start that next week. But what I'm going to do um, this morning is I'm going to share with you um, uh, what Austin Oaks Church is doing along with other churches across the great uh, city of Austin, Texas. Now, when I moved here in 2017, one of the things that I thought was really um, amazing was that there is a profound unity amongst churches in, in, in Austin, Texas. Um, in fact, when I learned about this, I learned about the organization that kind of brings them together called Christ Together Greater Austin, which our pastor emeritus, Rob Harrell, the former senior pastor here um, who served for 26 years, was an integral part of that organization. And so Austin Oaks Church was part of um, two previous campaigns that Christ Together did. One was Explore God, which if you remember, it was just this mass evangelism bliss of just asking questions about God and Jesus and heaven and hell. And then the latest series that they did was Love Where You Live. And so this is a year where they're launching another one called um, What's After ATX, okay? And, and I'm, I'm kind of, actually, I should say kind of, I'm very excited to be saying Austin Oaks Church is going to be part of this because what, like, I saw the number of churches that are participating in this series as we're trying to saturate the city of Austin with the hope of Jesus Christ. And I just want to show you this. I know you can't see the names, but I want you just to imagine when you see all these little white lines, those are a bunch of little churches. So like, look at this, okay? These are the list of all of the churches in the city of Austin that are choosing to be part of this campaign with the sole purpose to saturate, yeah, I mean, it's exciting, to saturate the city with the gospel of Jesus Christ, like, that's why we're doing this series, okay? And so we're t we picked a topic that is rather relevant and in, in kind of on the tips of people's tongues right now as it relates to life after life, right? And so, like, um, many people, I don't think I've ever met one person who has never thought about, is this all there is to life? Like, what happens after we die? You know, when I lived up north... Um, we always talked about that, like it was a common thing because there's a lot of Lutherans and Catholics and we understood life after life type of stuff. But like coming down to Austin, I, I found it rather fascinating that like spirituality in, in like is a rampant thing across the city. Not like saying evangelicalism or Christianity, but like new age stuff. I mean, like almost on every corner, every store, there's something there selling crystals or something else that's talking about some spirit, some power, some peace, some energy, some good vibes, and, and almost want to promote like, you know, everybody's good, we're all going to heaven, if there is a heaven, and all this kind of stuff. And it's just a fascinating topic because people are talking about it. If you look at culture, you look at the arts, you look at movies and songs and TV shows, spirituality is always seems to be a common thread these days. And if it's not just talking about like heaven, like just like for instance, okay, think about this, all of the demonic horror movies, that those are all spiritual, right? And so this is a common thing that's out there. And what we want to do as churches is to come into the city with this conversation saying, what's after life? Right? And what we want to do is we're going to take some stories through the medical community of people who had near-death experiences and not say this is the story or the proof of eternal life. This is just a story that we're going to use to engage to show the truth of Scripture as to what Jesus talks about, about the life to come. 
And so we're excited to partner with this, okay? And so on your seats, you're going to see these little books called What's After Life. This is a synthesized version of a much larger book called Imagine Heaven from John Burke. And if you know who John Burke is, if you don't, John Burke planted and founded the church, Gateway Church in Austin, Texas. Um, He wrote this book, Imagine Heaven, after interviewing uh, a thousand some people who had near-death experiences. And what he wanted to do in that book was basically show the common themes that have happened over thousands of stories of people from all over the world, different cultures, different religious backgrounds, and show how these common themes actually parallel the truth of Scripture. And so what we want to do, and I love how JJ says this, we want to enlarge heaven. We want to expand heaven. That's the hope. We want to engage in this. Because we know the scriptures teach that there is life after life. And that's why we celebrate Jesus Christ, right? He's our Savior. We needed him to rescue us from death and the grave and an eternal life of separation from God, which we call hell. That's the reality. And so since we know the truth, we want to come in where they're at on the conversations that are already happening and just go, hey, listen, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Let's see what God has to say about this, okay? So that's our heartbeat, and that's what we're going to do. And so this morning, what I'm going to attempt to do is give a a, a kind of like a preview sermon, because the plan of attack is, like, you've probably already seen it. There are billboards out there, you know, what's after ATX. There's a social media blitz that's targeting people with videos and stories and near-death experiences and resources, and we're equipping churches with a bunch of other things and tangible tools to engage people. What I want to do is just share with you what's to come. So we're going to be doing a sermon series on heaven from scriptural background from what the Bible has to say, and we're going to do that after Easter. And so that's a bunch of churches are going to be doing a sermon series of some kind like that after Easter in hopes that we would be intentionally inviting people on the cusp of all of the material and all the information that we've been doing in the city. Okay? So, is there a God? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Is there life after life? How do we know? How do we know where we go? Is there really a hell? If there is a hell, what does that really have to say about God? Do dogs go to heaven? Yes. (laughs) Cats? No. (laughs) I give you permission to leave if you want. I'm just so sorry. I grew up with cats and they terrified me. Didn't have any good experiences with them. I'm just saying, okay? But it's a huge topic. Right? Like, it, we know, like, we know as believers, like, right? Like, the hope of Jesus, the gospel is intimately connected to eternal life. Right? But the reality is, like, not just us, but even the rest of the world, we tend to live in denial that death happens. As far as I know, 100% of people die. As far as I know right? But yet we live in denial that act like we don't, or if we do, we don't really give a lot of thought to it, right? It's it's actually funny. I was listening to Dave Ramsey, and uh, and when he goes through Financial Peace University, he makes his little observation about how we live in denial of death. He says, it's funny that we call life insurance life insurance, when it really should be called death insurance. It's just like, but nobody would buy death insurance if it was called death insurance, so we call it life insurance, because we're in denial of death, Right? But it, the reality is we are going to face that. And um, what's fascinating about this whole concept of what's after ATX, now I'm going to, sh- I'm going to give you guys a, full, a few um, caveats and things that, that I struggle with in this series. I just want to let you know, like I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature. Okay, And so when I heard about this whole deal and talking about near-death experiences and all those stories, I immediately, my whole skepticism j- shot through the roof. Red flakes were going up. I was like, okay, okay, okay. But I wanted to know why they're doing this, why we're we engaging this. And I listened to some of the things that a lot of these pastors were talking about. And um, just from their observation of what's happening in the medical community with near-death experiences, they're going, let's leverage that to open up conversations Not to say that these near-death experiences are gospel. We're not saying that these near-death experiences ought to be the doctrine of our faith in the eternal life. Rather than these are subjective stories that happen to parallel coincidentally to what the Bible talks about. 
And so we want to use these stories. And so, for instance, one of the things I discovered as I was doing a lot of research on this, because, listen, I struggled with this. And, and it's like 13 million. Gallup poll has found that at least 13 million people in America have registered a near-death experience. Okay? That's about one of 25 people. In fact, it was fascinating. After the last service I just preached over in the classic service, I had someone come up and talk to me about a near-death experience that they didn't have, but they served as a, like a, um, uh, a critical care nurse, and they experienced it with a patient who was clinically pronounced dead for over an hour. Right? And so you just go, okay, let's just talk about that. And so if we're not willing to at least consider the medical evidence and like go, okay, these stories are happening, let's just use these as opportunities to talk about the truth of eternal life. Talk about what God has been telling us from the very, very beginning, okay? So I want to make this crystal clear. We are not putting our faith in subjective stories, Okay? We're not forming our theology of eternal life based upon these stories of NDE people. We're, we're not going to do that. We're going to listen to them. We're going to like, just go, wow, okay, we're going to come with this, a healthy dose of skepticism because we want to weigh it to what Scripture says. But listen, these are stories that our people are already talking about. They're reading. And not only that, the medical field is affirming that these stories are actually kind of pointing to the existence of an afterlife to which we go as Christians Yes, absolutely yes. We're not saying these things didn't happen, okay? But we're not going to deny the facts that they do happen, but we're basing our theology and our doctrine off of what scriptures say. Now, regardless, if a near-death experience has never happened, if there's no such thing as an NDE, Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life. Eternal life still happens. It's still through Jesus Christ, and it's still through the gospel. There's still heaven and hell, right? But what we're doing is we're going, okay, maybe we can capitalize on some of these things to engage people who don't know Jesus with the gospel, okay? So some of these stories, they say some very bizarre things. I know I'm going to save you from those bizarre stories. And, and like, okay, f- full, full disclosure, one of the reasons why I'm a skeptic is because I know, and I've seen it, and we know this too, that some people have used their near-death experience story to capitalize on making money, right? We know that. There's books and movies and things, and not saying that they're all wrong, their motives are all wrong, but we can't say that every single story has that as their motivation. In fact, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of these stories that come out, and and it's this really, really slim margin of people who are trying to use it for fame and popularity and wealth. The vast majority of them have nothing to lose. In fact, if it, they could even lose their credibility by talking about these experiences. And so we're trying to look at these themes and see what Scripture says about them. I believe that the Bible is 100% fully trustworthy, period. I believe that the God who lives in heaven, who created heaven, who sent his son from heaven, um, <clears throat> who also described heaven for us, through the lens of the kingdom of God, is infinitely more accurate than anybody else's experience. Okay? The Bible is true. Whatever the Bible says is true, and that's it. And the other part of the reason why we need to be slightly skeptical of these stories is because people are having an experience, and they're trying to interpret it through their own lens. They're trying to use their own language. They're trying to understand how it all meant. And a lot of them have traumatic experiences and emotions after the count, right? And so we, we know how this works. Like, let's just say you and I, we witnessed the same car accident, but I was on this corner and you were on that corner. Like, the way we would describe it would be totally different just based upon our perspective. So we got to understand that, okay? The third part that I would say, a reason why we need to bring some skepticism is because they actually never really crossed the threshold. And what I mean by that is the majority of these folks who described their near-death experience said there was some barrier, some threshold that they couldn't cross. They were not allowed to go over. So like, like they weren't like really, really dead. Yes, they were clinically dead, but there was something that they weren't able to cross over into, their stories would say. It's almost as if they're looking through a window and they're trying to explain it. Okay? So that's what we got to understand. Scripture is true. Everything's going to be weighed and measured off of Scripture. But when we look at these thousands of stories, 
we will quickly discover parallels. And there are some things that are really cool that I want to share with you that really kind of, for me, stir up my excitement for what is to come. Now, I don't know why. I can, I can uh, hypothesize why. I can say why it is for me. But why heaven doesn't get us too excited? Like, if, if God saved us, from this temporal life, and I'm going to show you some scriptures that we will all go, amen, right? We'll, we'll, we'll see some things where, like, our bodies are wasting away, and we're being renewed, and a new spiritual body, and, like, if we get to be with him, he's eternal life, like, like everything, like, like, we think about these things, and we can't even describe it. If you read Revelation, like, the book of Revelation is probably the most bizarre book we have in the Bible. Like, like, it's like John was, must, must have been agonizing trying to write this thing. So he's like, I'm seeing things I've never seen before. And you'll often hear him say, it was like, it was like, I, I, I don't know how to describe it. It was like a creature with four heads and one was a lion and wings. And it was like to see a sapphire. It was like, I don't know what I'm seeing. And he was like agonizing. Like just getting those little glimpses of that, like should make us go, oh my goodness. There's so much more. Everything we taste is just like a shadow of the things to come. Like we, as we discover Jesus through the gospel, as we reflect on him and know more of him, we should be more and more and more excited of the hope of heaven. And we should be more and more driven to want to tell people about Jesus. So what I want to do with the time that I have is I'm going to share with you some stories of NDE folks, near-death experience folks, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in some scripture, and then at the end, I'm going to encourage you how to live with eternity in view, okay? So one of the common themes that a lot of people talk when they have a near-death experience is that they tend to talk about their body, right? They, they tend to leave their body, but they remain in the same vicinity. They're looking down on their lifeless body. And it's almost as if they're having this outer body experience where their physical body is there, and they're almost talking about like having this experience through their spiritual body. And they can't tell. They constantly are struggling if they can't tell if they're dead because they feel more alive and more of themselves than they ever have before. And then what they thought would have been scary, death, is actually very invigorating. And this is what they have described to skeptical cardiologists, oncologists, and other doctors who are part of reviving them. And this has begun to convince skeptical doctors um, that there is an afterlife. In fact, it, it's moved a lot of these doctors to do an extensive research on this. One of the car cardiologists who spent years researching it was Dr. Michael Sabum, and he describes what changed his mind. Before talking with Pete, one of the, the folks who had a cardi cardiac arrest, he said, I didn't believe there was such a thing as a near-death experience. Pete told me he had left his body during his first cardiac arrest and watched the resuscitation. When I asked him to tell me what exactly he saw, he described the resuscitation with such detail and accuracy that I could have later used the tape to teach physicians. These people, like Pete, they saw details of the resuscitation that they could not otherwise have seen. One patient noticed the physician who failed to wear scuffs over his white leather shoes during open heart surgery. In many cases, I was able to confirm the patient's testimony with medical records and hospital staff. And so he went off to do this research in order to prove that NDFs are, are, are false, that they're not true, that there's some sort of drug-induced thing. And he said, I wanted to see if it would pass scientific muster, and it did. After five years of research, I published my findings in the book of Recollections of Death, and he published multiple articles in the Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, which is the prestigious medical um, journal publishing. And so Dr. Long a radiation oncologist was reading one of these articles in JAMA and he found it hard to believe until one night he was at dinner with some friends and um, one of his friends named Sheila mentioned that she had a food allergy once that made her code. And when I first read that, I went, computer? <laughs> God, I, I don't know. Like I was like, what is, and I had to look it up. I was like, what is coding? You know, I totally thought it was computer writing. And no, her heart stopped, okay? You guys are like, wow, he is not the brightest bulb, is he? Right. <laughs> so Dr. Long, he decided to probe and ask her some questions. Did anything happen to you when you coded? And you could tell that Sheila was hesitant and didn't really want to share much, but she began to share. She said, yes, I found myself at ceiling level. I could see the EKG machine I was hooked to. It was flatlined. 
The doctors and the nurses were frantically trying to bring me back to life. The scene below me was a near panic situation. In contrast to the chaos below, I felt a profound sense of peace. I was completely free from any pain. My consciousness drifted out of the operating room and moved into a nursing station, and I immediately recognized that this was the nursing station on the floor where I'd been prior to my, my surgery. From my vantage point near the ceiling, I saw the nurses bustling about performing their daily duties. So since then, Dr. Long, as he heard that, he went off and researched over 4,000 stories of people who had near-death experiences, and here's his conclusion. By studying thousands of detailed accounts of NDEers, I found the evidence that led to this astounding conclusion. NDEs provide such powerful scientific evidence that it is reasonable to accept the existence of an afterlife. I share that with you, not to go, hey, this, this, this is proving everything. It's like, no, 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 no. We already know that to be true. But as these stories are getting out into the public around us, they're having these conversations, and they're becoming curious and wanting to know. We get the opportunity to come in and explain these things to them. I mean, like, listen to some of these stories that just, like, are, are in my mind, a little bit mind-boggling if they're true. The Lancet, another prestigious medical journal, says... Um, of a patient who went into a cardiac arrest and got a death certificate, said at the time a tube was being placed in the airway to ventilate the patient, and it was noted that he had upper dentures. The dentures were removed and placed in the crash cart drawer while the patient was deeply comatose. Over a week later, the patient reported having an out-of-body experience, and they didn't know, at, when he came back and resuscitated, they didn't know where his dentures were, and remarkably, he declared to the, the nurses exactly where they could find his dentures. I mean, over and over and over, I mean, there's, there's been thousands of teams, thousands of hours and dollars that people have been diving into this, studying this, to know if this is a legit medical thing or not. And what they discovered is that 92% of the people's stories are accurate as they looked over the medical, uh, medical records and the, the experiences that the nurses and doctors had of those they had. Only 6% had some errors and 1% was completely erroneous. And what we see in, the, in these short little stories is something that the Bible already talks about and we already know, that there's a physical body and then when we die and re resurrect, like there talks about having this spiritual body. Like the real you is not this outer shell. And we talked about that. Like we know that like our skins, like our skin regenerates, the cells regenerate so rapidly that your body now is not the same body you had two months ago on the outside, right? So we know that. This is not us, right? But Scriptures talk about this. And so I want to show you some things here that I find fascinating, but I'm not going to make a statement saying this, this is what the, the final conclusion is, is this. So what I want to show you is a circumstance that happened to the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 14, verses 19 through 20. In this count, Paul, he's in Lystra. He met a man of light and discovered it was Jesus, right? And he gave his life to Jesus. And then he became a church planner and a powerful missionary for Jesus Christ. And in Acts 14, verses 19 through 20, there's, there's this story here um, that the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now, when people stoned people back then, the intention was to kill them, not hurt them. In fact, if you like would actually... I don't know why you would ever do this. I wouldn't suggest you do this. But, like, stoning wasn't like throwing little pebbles. I mean, it was like boulders, like crushing their skull type of deal. In fact, um, last time we were in Israel, our tour guide was talking to us um, about another method they did to stone people is they would push people off of cliffs, and then they would drop boulders from the cliffs on top of them, right? So in this case, like Paul, he, he was stoned, and obviously they assumed that he, he was dead, and, and so, like, even after that, it's like some people, like, they, they gathered about him, and then he just rose up, you, you know, kind of like doing this miraculous type of thing. Now, some scholars would say, not all, but some would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, now, I'm, I, I, listen, I'm not making a, a definite statement here that Paul had a near-death experience. I'm not saying that, because regardless, the point of his vision still holds true to what I want to share with you. But what's fascinating is, I know a man in Christ, Paul's talking about himself here in the third person. It's like this, 
this situation, this experience that he had was so intense. And he's talking about like boasting and being foolish and things he's boasting. And he doesn't even want to boast about this. In fact, it's simple, it's safe to deduce that he probably has never talked about this experience. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, and if we were to take the time from what we know, as best as we know, when the letter of Corinthians was written, and 14 years back in Paul's journeys, it would put him right around the area where he was stoned. So that's why some scholars would say, maybe this is what he's talking about was a near-death experience. If it is or it isn't, it doesn't matter, okay? Like, I just find that fascinating, okay? He was caught up to the third heaven. What's the third heaven? Like, have you ever read this and went, what? There's more than one? Like, what's the third heaven? He's just using cultural language. He's speaking to a Greco-Roman crowd who use this language often. The first heaven is the blue sky. The second heaven is the stars, it's space, the universe. And the third heaven was always described as the presence of God, where God was. Okay, so Paul is saying 14 years ago, something happened where I was caught up to the third heaven. And just notice this, he, he doesn't even know how to explain what happened. Whether I was in the body or of the body, I don't know. But God knows. Something happened. I'm not sure what it was. Either if it was a near-death experience or just a vision that he had. It was this almost like this outer body experience, but maybe it wasn't out of his body. He just didn't really know. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. This is the same word that Jesus used to the thief on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So that's how we know the third heaven. We're talking about heaven. And again, he goes, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but God knows. And, and he goes, I heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. It's almost as if like he heard from like God, maybe like you can't share this. I mean, it was so intense and so overwhelming that something happened in this moment of like Paul trying to argue a case to the church according to like, I'm bringing it up. I mean, and, and this is what fueled his missionary journeys was the revelations and experiences that he had with God. He had eternity in view. In fact, if you keep reading this, he talks about like God has given me a weakness so I don't become conceited in this. Like understanding that all of his momentary troubles, he would consider them light in comparison to the things that are out there. But what I find fascinating is that almost 100% of near-death experience stories talk about leaving a physical body and having what it seems to be a spiritual body, which is exactly what the scriptures teach. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, talking about our physical bodies. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it's raised in power. It's like this body is not what it's meant to be. Sin has ravaged this body. It is sown a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body. And if there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. <clears throat> For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Talking about the physical, to, you know, the, the physical body to the spiritual body. For indeed, by putting it on, we may not, we, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in his tent, we groan being burdened, right? Amen? You, you feel that? You're like, oh, right? Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Like this, this is, I love this because this is something that we forget about. It's like, yes, this body is a temporal body. And when we die, we're going to put on a spiritual body. And we get to use these stories just to go, listen, what they are experiencing, in fact, supports the Bible. The Bible has been talking about this for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, since the beginning of time. <clears throat> Vicky, who is blind from birth, just another story. She flatlined after a bad car accident. No brain function, heart was dead, she was pronounced dead. And she had a hard time as she also had this near-death experience adjusting to visual perception, but she realized as she was looking down at the doctors working on her body. 
She said, then I finally recognized my, my wedding ring in my hair, and her hair was down to her waist, and her wedding ring had orange blossoms on it, so she identified both. And here, I love this, because Vicky is a believer, and here's what she had to say. And I thought, this is my body down there? Am I dead or what? They were trying to frantically work on this thing that I discovered was my body, and I felt very detached from it, and I thought, I'm out of here. I can't get these people to listen to me. And as soon as I thought that, I went up through the ceiling as if it were nothing, and it was wonderful to be out there and to be free, not worrying about bumping into anything, and I knew where I was going. And I heard this sound of wind chimes. That was the most incredible sound that I can describe. Vicky noticed that she was fully herself and had a distinct form and a non-physical body, she said, was made of light. And then she found herself going up through a dark enclosure, kind of like a tunnel. And she heard sublimely beautiful and exquisite harmonious music she had tra- that had transitioned into songs of praise to God. And as she reached the end of the tunnel, she found herself on grass. Trees and flowers and a vast number of people surrounded her in a place of tremendous light. And the light, Vicky said, was something that you could feel as well as see. Even the people she saw were bright. She said, everybody there was made of light, and I was made of light, and what the light conveyed was love. There was love everywhere. It was love that came from the grass, from the birds, from the trees. It was incredible, really beautiful, and I was so overwhelmed by the experience. Like, when, when I read this account, I was just like, man, what's, what's really fascinating to me was that, you know, on this, uh, in life, she, Vicky was blind, but now she's describing not like light coming onto things, but light coming out of things. Like, like how would she get that experience? But what's, what I love is that, again, scriptures talk about this. Scriptures talk about, like look at like, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. I mean, we know that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But in Revelation 21, <coughs> excuse me. 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. (laughs) By its light the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And then again, like in the Old Testament, Daniel, speaking of things to come and speaking of people even in heaven, like you just go, okay, is this metaphorical or is there some like reality to this? And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, they shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay? The Bible always teaches heaven and hell. But here's what I found fascinating. By its light will the nations... We went backwards. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn made many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It's like painting this picture here, like those who lead many to righteousness will shine like stars. It is a very similar thing to Vicky's account. Like we will share in his glory. Like we don't know what this all looks like, but what we do know is that Jesus is the light of life. His light is life. Like I, I love how this speaks. And so here's the last little piece. And the reason why I said all that is because there was a researcher, a, a, a couple, who um, really struggled with this. And they wanted to know if culture, religion, and ethnicity influenced their near-death experience reporting. And so what they did is they, they interviewed 500 people in America who had a near-death experience who were also Protestant evangelicals. And then they interviewed 500 people in India Um, who were practicing Hindus, who had near-death experiences. And what they discovered was absolutely astounding. That religion had no influence at all on the themes that emerged other stories. In fact, out of the 500 Hindus who shared a near-death experience, not one, not one reported anything that resembled any facet of the Hindu religion. Not one. There was no reincarnation, no disillusion into Brahma. There was no Shiva, no other gods. But over and over and over and over, there were accounts of them seeing or experiencing a man in white carrying a book of accounts. Where, do they, where, where does that happen? Like, is it true? Is it not true? They're telling that story. That's not in any of the religion uh, tenets. But we know that's the... The reality is that when we die, there's a a life review of sorts. We have to give account for our life. There will be a judgment. Now, again, 
These stories don't shape how we see eternal life. They're subjective. And we're going to use them as opportunities to engage people with conversations about what the scriptures teach. Okay? We want people to see Jesus. Because the reality is, folks, heaven and life with Jesus forever is far greater than you could have ever imagined. It's far greater than I could have ever imagined. It's not boring. It can't be boring. For many, many years, I thought heaven was sitting on a cloud with a harp. They're finally going, is it just really one long church service? Like, all we're going to do is sing? Come on, like, right? Have you ever thought that? Like, we're just going to sing the whole time? <laughs> no. Time does, time's not even a word in heaven. Think about that for a bit. I mean, you get to be with loved ones. You get to be with dogs. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things in Revelation. Like, if you just look at Revelation and just get caught up in the wonder of what John is trying to describe. I mean, Paul quoting Isaiah 64, 65 in 1 Corinthians 2. Like, he just starts talking about it. It's like, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind. Like, the heart of man has even comprehended what God has prepared in advance for those who love him. Folks, like... We, we got to understand that when we talk about Jesus, like now I'm talking about for those of us who believe in Jesus, like our joy is connected to eternal life. And this is eternal life that we would know him. In fact, if you were just to look at the life of the Apostle Paul, I mean, this man lived for heaven. It was always on the forefront of his mind. If you read Romans and just like the great, beautiful portrait of the gospel of Jesus, eternal life was always in those pages. In fact, if you go to Philippians chapter 1, like verse 1 through 13, he starts talking about like, you know, it's like, I was going to die and I would rather die and be with him, but I decided to stay because you need me to stay. To die is, get, right? Like he starts talking about that. And I remember reading that as a, a young man and just going, Paul, you're kind of twisted. Like, what's wrong with you? You want to die? Like, I get it, but like, you know, but he understood something. If you continue reading in Philippians chapter 3 and 4, you start to see, it's like, man, everything in this life is all temporal. Everything that we think matters in this life doesn't really matter. In fact, a lot of the stories that we see that come from entities, they even say that as like what we think matter doesn't really matter. And he's like, listen, I want to know the power and the resurrection power of Jesus. I want to know him. I want to know the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And the more he knew Jesus, the more he wanted to be with Jesus. But yet he also knew that until the Father called him home, he had a purpose to be in here, to be on mission, to tell people about Jesus, because the reality is there is life after life. We need to tell people in Austin that there's life after Austin, Texas. And it's going to be one or the other. I don't like the concept of hell, church. I, I don't. I really don't. I don't think God does either. He doesn't want any to perish. Scriptures teach that. So he sent his son to die the sacrifice, give his life, to do what they could not do for themselves, right? And offer it to them as a gift of grace to receive, to make the choice. And in that moment, they would cross over from death to life. You know what happens to us when we live with an eternal perspective? One, we are able to navigate our own trials and our own temptations well. I mean, look, look, look at this. In Romans chapter 8, in Romans chapter 8, those screen guys are like, man, Brandon, stop it. Look at what how Paul writes this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the eternal, with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Oh, like Paul's like, like, like any suffering. Like dude, dude just got stoned and like, you know what I mean? Like with stones, like he, he got like suffering and persecuted and all this stuff and lonely and shipwrecked. Right? Like, and he's like, none of, like, this is nothing. 
this present suffering, it's not even worth comparing to what is coming. I get this spiritual body. I get to be with Jesus. I get to be in heaven. He's going to wipe away the tears. There's going to be joy. My body's going to feel great. Like, I'm not going to, like, my outer body's not going to be deteriorating and wasting away. Like, my knees won't hurt. <laughs> yeah, can I get an amen? Come on. It's like, like even though there's, there's more to that, but that's a good little benefit right there. But it's just like, I mean, Paul lived with this in mind. It shaped everything for him. I mean, he goes on to even say in like 2 uh, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, talking about this light and momentary struggle, right? We don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away. Anybody feeling that? Right? Like your outer self is wasting away, but our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look to the things that are seen, but to the, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I mean, the Apostle John in 1 John 3 He's like just going off on, on the Father's love. He's like, man, the Father loves us. We've been adopted. And he starts talking about it's like, but we don't even know what we really are until we see him. Then we will know. Like we struggle with understanding that we're adopted sons and daughters. We struggle to believe in our identity in Jesus. Imagine the moment when you're in heaven and you know without, without any doubt that you are his son or his daughter. No question. When we live for eternity, folks, it changes things. It's our hope that there's something to come, that there's more to life, and it's far better than we could ever ask or imagine. Way better. But I love some other facets. It focuses us to love people well. Because Paul, what he would say is like, we no longer regard people according to the flesh. Everybody's a spiritual being. You're, you're heading one way or the other. C.S. Lewis said that, right? He says, you never meet a mere mortal, ever. We get the opportunity to tell people about the hope of Jesus that we have, that we've tasted, that we experienced, that we can say is just a glimpse of the things to come. The best is yet to come, truly. And so as we're in this time, I want to encourage you Please encourage you. Yes, look at these stories of NDE stuff with a healthy dose of skepticism. Absolutely. Don't let that to influence your faith and your theology and doctrine of eternal life. Let scriptures do that. But use these resources and tools to engage people outside of the church who don't know Jesus. And start asking them questions about what life is like. And how do you know? Do you know where you're going? And et cetera, et cetera. And so we use those tools. Read that book. And here's my challenge to you. The moment you finish reading it, give it to someone else. I just say, hey, can we some, find a time later to talk about this? And so we're going to do some things down the road to equip you and challenge you and encourage you to be part of this because we want to see heaven enlarged. We want people to know Jesus. We want people to know the light of life through Jesus Christ. So Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that in you there is life that you are the light Lord that there's, there's no way we can put words or even understandings to anything that is to come and Lord it, it, and I gotta admit it is a little fun to be curious about these near death experience stories and imagine what heaven could be like but Lord I pray that you protect our hearts keep us close to you and your word and your spirit Lord, I pray for people in our lives who don't know you. Lord, that you, you would um, intervene and that they would encounter some of this material. And Lord, that you would begin to prime and ready a conversation. So Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see. Lord, give us eyes to see people the way you see people. Lord, give us eyes to see the hope of heaven. Lord, give us the ability to live with eternal life in view. 
So, Lord, we ask that you would speak and do your work in our hearts as we respond in worship. Lord, would you navigate our hearts, pastor us, convict us of sin, encourage us where we need to be encouraged. We pray this in Jesus' name.